Good morning, everyone. Welcome to DrupalCon. I'm Nick Vidal. I'll, I'll be your room monitor today. And if you guys need any help, please let me know. Uh, we're going to start out a session called Rules Without the User Interface by David Kitchen from London. So I'll pass him the word. Thank you, David. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you've all got here fine and uh, ready to start this morning. Uh, so, um, rules without the UI and how to include default rules in your module. Um, our agenda for the session, uh, I'm just going to show you here, um, it always seems to do this, uh, slow for the first slide. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm just going to give some introductions to myself and uh, what we're going to talk about. Um, talk about the actual rules module and how you can use it in your module. Uh, we're going to have a short little break in the middle of the presentation to uh, relax everyone and then look at a case study of how to use uh, rules in, the, uh, in your module. Um, some information about where you can find out more about using rules in your module and then time for some questions at the end. So I'm David Kitchen, as I said. I work for Commerce Guys. I started there in October this year, uh, sorry, October last year, got the uh, date wrong there, uh, but we have uh, opened the uh, office in the uh, UK then, and that's when I started. And here are some of the uh, modules that I've uh, worked on. I look after a module for doing European VAT, um, but also worked on uh, payment gateways, uh, recommender system, and other modules. Uh, including uh, Carl on file, which has just recently uh, been released. And uh, a lot of these modules all use rules, and it is quite a core part of commerce and uh, how it works. Um, so I hope that's uh, uh, something that's going to talk about and uh, pick out here. So the rules module itself, um, it's a system for providing uh, event condition action uh, programming. And it's maintained by uh, uh, Ulkan Zyga or Fargo uh, on Drupal.org. And um, uh, so that's the URL for it there. And I'm sure you've all used it. Um, and just to get on there, I just wanted to get some idea of uh, uh, what we've got in the audience here. So I can get a, a show of hands who, of who's uh, um, written a rule using the UI. And is anyone? Um, uh, written some uh, their own events or actions in rules to uh, using them, and has anyone um, actually written a default rule uh, using code uh, and uh, included that in the module yet? <laughs> that's, uh, so that's that's good. That's that's what you're all here to find out about. So um, just going through why we want to support rules. Uh, so rules actually is really easy to use. It's non-intrusive, and um, it unifies functionality between modules and provides good practice to learn from as well. So it's a framework for event condition action programming. It can be used by lots of other modules once you've started uh, using rules. So uh, that includes things like views, bulk operations. Once you've provided uh, some rules functionality, you can use rule, views, bulk operations can use rules. Uh, to provide those uh, operations. And uh, you can combine with other modules to provide some really useful functionality uh, that a site builder can uh, use to their benefit when they're actually using a, a site. So I've just got this here. This is a quote from a blog post from Wunderkraut, um, which is, uh, I think, really useful that rules is a complex framework. Uh, to some extent, it is heavy. But the fact that event condition action style modules are pretty common, and it doesn't make sense not to have a framework for them. Rules may not be the perfect tool, but it, but it is a good tool that can be improved. As was said in that blog post from 2011. And some of the key points about rules, it is configurable, exportable, you can clone them, reuse the components, and it provides a unified functionality across systems. And you can really get some, some quick uh, solutions. And even 
yesterday, here's uh, an example. This was on um, uh, Sunday. There was a module released, uh, which is uh, an API for Jenkins. And it is just basically a set of rules, actions, that can be used by anyone now to integrate with their own site build or module. And uh, once those actions have been provided, they're really easy to then use within rules. So it provides them actions for triggering a build and uh, creating a new job or copying an existing job within the uh, uh, system. And that's, so this is the, the, the whole point of using rules. Um, someone, if those were just uh, um, actions within a module that someone has to go away and start coding and interacting with, uh, it's a lot more work uh, for actually uh, building a site. So start to look at how you can support rules in your module that you're developing. The first part is a rules ink module, and this provides a um, data info about what your module can provide to rules. And this covers data types. Um, so if your module provides a specific data type um, beyond the standards that are available, such as strings and integers, um, you can provide details of that here. Um, one of the examples of those is um, the um, VAT module provides a data type that taxes um, in, that are in commas. Um, it exposes those as a data type in uh, rules to use it for um, conditions. You can then provide events. And uh, so this is when something is happening within your module. You can uh, provide an event that can be used to uh, trigger a uh, reaction rule. Conditions, so this is where you're trying to provide a, a, a simple one-step condition. Rules provide some standard conditions for comparing strings or integers or Boolean values. Uh, but if you've got a complex condition, you can provide um, some functionality that actually reviews those. And then the actions. This is generally providing a um, the information about functions in your module and how rules can use those to um, uh, create uh, an event um, action from those. If you're providing entities within your module, it's really quick and easy to get some information about those entities into rules. So by just making sure your uh, entity info and entity property info has full of set of information uh, about create, save, and delete, uh, access callbacks, the properties that are available on the entity type. Once you've provided all that information in those um, uh, hooks, the rules will pick all of those up and be able to provide those as actions for creating and saving and editing those entities in the rules actions. Um, just check out more here. And of course, those if you're dealing with a uh, entity that's provided by another module, then you can use the entity info alter to uh, add those in if they're missing from uh, another entity type. So, the core part of this, the default rules, is a just like you might have done in views, providing a default view. There's a file. Uh, just to be slightly confusing, it's got an S on defaults. Um, but once you've got that module there, with uh, that uh, file there with your hook default rules configurations in, uh, that's returning an array of the rule object, you can uh, provide those default rules in there. And there is also a default rules configuration alter hook to provide an alter uh, rules that are being provided by another module. So the rules components. There are um, the first part. First type of rule is the reaction rule. This is the core part. It has three parts to the rule: the event, the conditions, and actions. There's always at least one event for a reaction rule, but you can have multiples. So this could be on saving a entity or creating an entity as um, both of them are two different events within the rules uh, events system. Conditions, again, multiple conditions, uh, providing the uh, requirements that need to be passed for this uh, rule to take place. 
And then the actions, again, multiple actions, taking any of the information that's gathered in the events, so if the event was saving a user, then you've got the user entity available to provide as an action, or through the conditions, you can, in effect, look up other bits of information. Then there are the components. And again, there's a rule, but this is without an event. So this is a combination of both conditions and actions to form a rule. Condition sets uh, can be grouped in either an or or an and set. And these can be included on your rule or reaction rule within conditions. And uh, very similar, there is an action set. So this is a group of actions to put together. Uh, and you can include that as an action within another rule. And this level of reusable components uh, can be very useful for um, grouping together the action sets and taking that information that you've got in your conditions and providing some parameters into those action sets depending on the conditions that have been met through the rule. Um, each of these, uh, so we're starting to get here into writing them in code and uh, we start with creating a rule and each of these takes um, for the components a set of variables. That's the inputs that's going to be taken into the rule and then any um, output that provides. This is the data of the information that's going to come back out of that uh, condition set or rule set. And these can be um, the data sets that I mentioned before uh, or any entity type within Drupal. So we start with a creating our rule or a component. Uh, start with just a, the object we've created, and start we start adding a label, some description. Uh, the tags can be very useful to provide some information in organising the rules within the uh, UI. Uh, you can set a rule to be um, active uh, when it's the module is installed or disabled. Um, on this example, all of our uh, payment gateway modules within Drupal Commerce are provided with the rule that comes with them disabled and a merchant can then activate the rule when they're ready to uh, activate the payment gateway. And once you've got that, if it's a reaction rule, then you add the events to the object, conditions and actions. It's important to keep the um, simple the way that rules work. Rules will always stop as soon as it reaches a false condition. So it always works really well to try and keep your simplest conditions first within the condition sets. So if it's going to find a false condition, it processes it as quickly as possible, rather than trying to process any complex um, conditions that it's going to have to pass through. Um, one of the things that you don't have in rules is a way of saying else or else if. Um, so there are um, options of um, doing that by providing multiple components. Um, so there is also a module that adds on to rules to provide some else and else if conditions. But if I give an example of creating a shipping conditions, so if we're wanting to calculate some shipping in commerce, we have a reaction rule that's based on the event of calculate shipping. This is a request within commerce that takes place during the checkout process. And we've got a rule, that's our reaction rule, which is the area, the, the three lines in the uh, blue at the top. And it's got a condition to check that the order has some shippable products. Then as the action, we've got three um, rule components that are uh, as the action. And each of those has a set of conditions that uh, will step through those. So in this case, our first action is to uh, a rule to check if the address is within the UK. And if it is, then it will provide a UK shipping price. The second, uh, and if this was um, return false, it would move on to the next uh, rule condition uh, set, the rule action set. So we've got uh, two conditions in this one to say that the rule is in the EU but not in the UK. 
and then we can get an EU shipping price. And then finally, a question of is the address um, not in the UK and not in the EU? And that is a way of providing the else if conditions within the um, rule. Um, so as I said, uh, we're just going to have a intermission now. Uh, apart from working for Commerce Guys, I'm also involved in a company in my spare time that uh, films aeroplanes uh, called Planes TV. So I've just got a one minute video that I'm going to play and it gives me a chance to drink some water and you to enjoy a video. <coughs> Now we're going to move on to a case study. Hopefully you've taken all of that information in that we've just done. Had a bit of time to process it there. And we can now look at how we actually use the, uh, um, the uh, default rules. So I'm going to use an example. Uh, this is a module that we've just uh, been launching and I've been working on, which is called Exacta. It's a system for um, calculating sales tax in the US. And it's got three actions within the module. And these are for submitting an order for tax calculation, committing the order, and then refunding it. So firstly, just talk about providing the action within the module. Uh, the action takes some information, which is the customer billing and shipping address, the address that the order is being shipped from, and the order itself. And um, off, once it's got that, it will send it off to the system for calculation, and that returns some uh, data about the tax that's been calculated for the order. So within the hook rules data info that I mentioned before, we're going to provide the action information, and this uh, includes a label for the information about the action, the parameters that I mentioned that it will take for the action, and in this case, we've got the order, uh, which is an entity uh, provided by the type. We've got a billing address, shipping address, and from address. And these are all the address field type. And it's grouped together. And then we have our execute callback. This is the function that the module provides that um, this action is going to call. Now, it, this is really useful, so within the UI, once a site builder comes to use this, they can configure this action to be exactly how they want it to happen. Rather than making any assumptions on the system, so uh, especially within commerce, the way that the store is set up can very verify between stores. And the actual information of where the billing address or the shipping address is held might be different. So being by providing this in rules, we provide an easy way for the site to configure these details. So to provide the default rule for this uh, action, we need to decide when is this going to take place. 
and this is at the point that the customer reaches the checkout review page within the checkout process. And at this point, they've entered in their billing address and shipping address, if shipping is enabled, and have selected their shipping method to get a price for shipping. And once all of this has been collected together, it's got all the information that's needed for this um, action to take place. There's also a second time that this uh, rule is going to be called, and that is when a merchant changes an order after it's already been placed. So we want to be able to recalculate uh, this data if the order has been placed by the cons customer, it's been payment has been received, but the merchant has decided, oh, we've not got something in stock, we're going to have to cancel that line item and refund. They need to then recalculate the tax because it may have changed. So the event that we're going to use for this is going to be the um, order pre-save. This is the moment before an order is saved. We're going to be able to check some conditions on that order and then uh, set the action that's going to take place. So here's the start of our default rules configuration. So we're creating a reaction rule in this case, um, providing a label, as I said, for it. We can include some information about what modules are required for this rule to be able to work. So in this case, we need rules. Uh, it needs to have the Commerce Exacta Calc module available and the Entity module. And if these modules aren't available, it would disable this rule to make sure it doesn't try and run when it can't. So as I said, the events we're going to provide based on the uh, is the Commerce Order Pre-Save. So these are all provided by uh, different modules, and in this case, the Commerce Order module provides this event because it's all there in the entity type, so it just happens and it's there. <coughs> what I actually do here is create a, um, a rules or condition set using rules or that I'm going to include within the rule at the end. So our first question is, uh, it does the uh, data is, which is the question, and we're going to check that the commerce order status is in uh, the review um, status. So in this case, we could have multiple values in this array that's shown here for the value. And again, we also check that the commerce order state is in pending. This is the state um, that is after the checkout uh, review. And just to point out, there's two different, slightly different uh, datas here. One is status and one is state. And the status is, uh, there are multiple statuses within each state. Um, so the state for the first one is actually checkout, but then there's multiple statuses within that state. And the reason why we're providing this default rule with these default settings is that this is a general assumption. So what a merchant can do is decide to change this default rule that's been provided to them based on their configuration, which is all about this, this being able to provide a rule rather than making any assumptions on, on what's going to be there. So we then add that condition to the rule. It's the main rule that we're building up. And then some more conditions. And anyone that's been building rules will know the uh, trap that uh, usually is experienced the first time, and that is that you need to check that the entity has a field before the field is available. So I'm including here our conditions to check that the entity, which is the commerce order, has the billing field. And then we need to check that that billing profile that's found through the billing field has an address field. And Finally, just to check that the address has been set before trying to run this rule, uh, we check that the, um, the country field is not empty. So to be able to, to do a not condition, um, you can see here that, that the condition is a, uh, has another um, function in it, which is a rules condition. And um, at the end of that, we can add the negate option to that condition before including it with the rule. The next stage on this uh, slide here, now this is where 
being able to provide a default rule in code really works really well um, is conditions that depend on other modules being available or not. Now, if you've um, tried exporting rules before, you'll have noticed that they export in a JSON format, and there's a function called rules import for importing a rule in. And this is um, uh, one of the ways that you can bring in default rules. Um, but by providing um, some conditions using PHP within the um, settings, we can check to see if here the comma shipping module is enabled. Because if the shipping module is enabled, we're going to then check to see if the entity has a shipping profile and that the shipping profile has an address and that the address is not empty. So if the shipping module was enabled, we're going to add the action here, which is to check that the, uh, we're going to pass the invoice request action, pass the order, and within the billing and shipping address, the, um, we can provide the billing and shipping address. And uh, here we don't provide the from address. Um, I um, can't remember if that was shown out. I forgot to mention. On the, uh, when we provided the action here, um, you can see that the, um, just, just here, the, um, the actual from address is an optional field, and the action doesn't require that from address. Uh, but the, through the development process, we wanted to be able to offer a store that had multiple warehouses, a way of saying where the from address was. So they can extend this default rule that we're providing to be able to say where the, uh, the from address is. So we don't provide that in the default rule. And then finally, there's the um, action. If the billing, uh, if the shipping module wasn't enabled, we're going to just provide the billing address as both the shipping and billing address details. Um, one of the important parts uh, to note is the um, the select bit at the end of the um, the first part here. So this is. Um, this is when we're entering in an entity or, or a field as opposed to just a piece of data. So if this is uh, anyone using the rules U UI will have, uh, you know that you can use the data selector to find something within the rule. And to be able to provide that, we just need to provide the select information here. So this is the variables that are being passed through the rule. So the, finally, we save that into the configuration array to, uh, uh, as a rule with the name of the rule. And that's going to be available as a default rule in, uh, uh, once it's, this module is enabled. So you can provide uh, so some locations for finding some more information. There's some really good uh, modules that work well with um, rules. So I mentioned before, there's a conditional uh, module rules conditional. This adds the else and else if into the action zone. It's, uh, um, it works to some extent, but it's only available in the actions. Um, and it often, actually, you end up using rules components in there. Um, the rules batch loop, this is a module that, um, that I did as well. Um, rules provides a loop functionality. So if you're dealing with a large number of objects uh, or entities, so um, you've got an event that collects up um, a group of entities. This, uh, uh, for example, we've recently been working on um, the recurring framework for Drupal Commerce, and uh, this uh, allows you to process uh, recurring subscription payments. And uh, what it will do on a daily process is collect up all the recurring subscriptions that need to take place and loop through all of those. But um, De by default, rules will just use a, a, a for each loop effectively, uh, but this module allows you to push that off to the um, uh, rules, the uh, Drupal batch uh, loop uh, batch process, and that's provided by a. Um, you can again extend rules in uh, the actual um, component types that are available. 
So this is a rules batch loop is a new component type. So if you want to extend rules, you can bring in new component types. So this may be um, more than the or or the and uh, condition groups. Um, so there's a lot of extension possibilities there. Um, rules integrates with context, feeds, web form, the domain module. This is really useful for uh, multi-site uh, systems. Um, menu, controlling those. Uh, there's cache actions based on rules. So this is clearing caches on a rule event. Services has an integration with rules. There's a Facebook rules module. Um, transformers and data transformers that allow you to convert those data types. So if you've got an integer that you've brought into rules and you want to convert that to a, a different data type to a string, there's uh, ways of converting those. Um, this, uh, the HTTP client is uh, quite useful. This, uh, if you're building an integration with um, some other REST service where you need to post information to that, uh, there's a HTTP client that will really quickly allow you to post that uh, data through to them. And then, as I said, views bulk operations is really useful. If you've got a action set uh, that will take a uh, any type of entity, you can drop those in and uh, into your view and provide a bulk operation. So um, uh, one of those examples in commerce is moving the order states. So you can select 10 orders, pass it to um, the rules, and the rules will process those orders. So some locations for some uh, more information. There's a quite a good little book called The Tiny Book of Rules. That's a PDF that's available um, from Drupal.org. Uh, the links are uh, for all of these are on the session page. Uh, the Drupal.org uh, documentation and the uh, Node 1 have a really great section, selection of videos that's uh, quite a long session, I think, um, something like uh, 10 different chapters in those videos of how to use the rule framework. And they're a really good selection of resources for um, finding out more about rules and how to use them. So I move on to ask uh, if you've got any questions. And if you do have, there's a microphone just at the front here. Uh, as I said, the session's been recorded. So um, if you want to just uh, come up and queue up to the microphone, I think it's the. If you guys could form of, uh, a line here to speak. Do you have any techniques that you'd suggest for debugging rules when you're building default rules to pass in with your modules? Um, so. Um, the, uh, the rules debugger, so you can, uh, in the advanced settings for rules, you can switch on the rules debugger that uh, will output the um, status of each condition that's being processed through and tell you whether it's being uh, passed true or false. Um, one of the um, problems that you often get is when you're bringing your, um, your rule that you're trying to import, if, it's, if it doesn't quite understand it, it will just give up. Um, what you can do is uh, I, I often will try building the rule first through the UI that I want to create and uh, you can export that in the JSON format and you're going to be able to sort of, you can see from that format uh, where you're trying to build the, the object uh, that you're trying to build through. So that's probably the, the easiest way just to sort of see uh, where you're going and um, it can help just to figure out what the, um, the, the exact uh, um, condition name is, the, the, the um, uh, checking that the um, uh, value is empty is an example of that. So it's a, um, so to check, like that example I showed there, to check that a value, ha a, a, a variable has something in it, you have to say data is not empty, which is double negative, but uh, that's uh, finding that information out uh, shows you. And, and the hardest bit is that adding the negate on at the end is often the, the, the bit that gets uh, lost. So, I hope that's. Answer? Yes, thanks. Uh, perhaps it's uh, perfectly obvious, but it, it may not be. And in, in, in context of this talk, it's good to point out that you can programmatically trigger rules actions. Uh, yes, so um, any. Uh, you can invoke a rule from uh, your module. So this is something that happens uh, in uh, commerce as well uh, for invoking rules, uh, particularly to do with tax calculation. So you can invoke a, um, a rule without having to have an event. So as your, rule, as your module 
process is something, this may be on uh, Entity Save, you can just automatically always invoke a rule that you've got configured. Um, and so once that's invoked, it will just trigger that off and pass through. Yeah. I worry a lot about performance. One of the things you said earlier is that uh, the rule system is heavy. Can you qualify that and tell me what that means? Um, so, um, yeah, so there's, there's the problem of having the rule system uh, that you're adding in uh, quite a big chunk of uh, modules and system to your site. Um, one of the things that uh, certainly within commerce that we've reviewed it as, um, once, we've got the, once you've got rules in and you're being, it's available there to reuse, then um, you've got a huge uh, advantage. One of the examples on the, uh, the blog post that I mentioned from Wondercrown is comparing the using rules for configuring and controlling um, the menu, uh, meta tags on a page, the page title, the uh, um, blocks that are available on a page. And this all replaces a number of modules, such as the page title, uh, menu conditions, contexts. And being able to provide all of that just through one um, action framework, then you can cut out a lot of other modules. And uh, so that's something that, that uh, um, it, it's, a, it's a weighing up those balances actions of deciding um, you can either go all the way in and use rules quite heavily uh, for all sorts of things that are happening on, on the site build that you're working on. And if you're doing that, then you're, you're getting the benefit of it without having all the other um, small modules that have events and actions that are competing and all happening at the same time. And um, one of the sites that I've previously worked on uh, where you can end up with uh, groups, multiple developers working on different stages and you've got um, multiple things that are happening on, say, um, node save. So as you've got several modules all hooking in saying, at node save, I just want to check something and do something. And another one that says, I want to check something and do something else somewhere else. And suddenly you're finding you'll get a performance hit because uh, you've got all these modules all trying to do things at the same time and then trying to debug and find which is the thing that's slowing it down. Um, you can, it uh, becomes a trouble of trying to find all of those things. Whereas if they are, if you're using rules and you've got the event node save, you can just look and see all those um, rules and switch them on and off and quite quickly find the thing that's actually causing that performance uh, hit rather than having to go through all of these modules and trying to find the hooks that are being pulled in and at wh which stage it's happening. It uh, gives some, some ideas of um, ways of, of improving performance with rules. Yep. Got it. Um, one thing that I haven't had the opportunity to use much, and I know it's used a lot in the commerce framework, are components. And I was wondering if you uh, could talk a bit about um, how to um, create and manipulate in code uh, components to handle complicated pieces of logic that uh, you might not think a customer could readily configure in the UI. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can talk about that uh, in detail with the experience of our, um, the European VAT module, uh, which is, uses uh, components uh, in quite detail. So um, it actually generates uh, uh, the rules using uh, um, the information that's available about the tax rates and uh, countries. Uh, to create a set of uh, components that are conditions to check which country an order is in. And um, using the, uh, there's a, um, uh, so you, you have a range of components. So there's 27 countries uh, in the EU that are all part of the VAT system. Um, and you need to check that the, um, that the order is um, within one of those countries. And some of these have small components. One, some of them are simple just to check that the, uh, order is in a particular country, but some are slightly more complicated because, um, for example, Germany, there are two postcodes that are not included within VAT. So you start to get some, some more complicated things, and these are provided within the rules components. And then you can just provide all of those components and just throw them into the main rule, is it in the EU? Um, where we've been able to use that uh, in a slightly more complex way is um, for business-to-business -business transactions between different countries, uh, there's a mechanism for um, what's called reverse charging taxes. So there's no tax on the transaction. And um, 
this is only where the order is in a different country to the country of the store. Um, so in this case, we use, I use the, the default rules alter to be able to add in um, a secondary module. So there's, if the store needs to enable this business functionality for business to business transactions, uh, it picks up a default rule alter that finds the relevant country rule uh, that's a component and um, amends that to say um, not in the not in the home country of the store, and uh, that really works really well. Um, uh, and if anyone wants some, some more information, I can probably show that, or we can might be uh, arranging a, a boff with some more information about looking at rules and components in in more detail and how those can be created. Um, but those those components work work really well. As I say you can add them to a rule quite easily. Uh, so, just adding a component in the conditions or the actions is just simply uh, uh, just a case of saying, I want to add this component into the rule, and you've, you've added it into the rule. And, and as I also said about uh, that example with the um, shipping calculation, you can uh, have nested components as, as much as you want. So, you've got your first uh, reaction rule with a condition. Uh, that is a component that may have components within it as well. So you can nest them uh, down. And by doing that, you're getting that, um, actually being able to reuse those components as well. So you may have a simple condition that is, um, is the user, does the user have this role? And you're only going to reuse that component in multiple rules. So just have, create that component once and then reuse the whole component rather than having to create the, does the user have this role every time you want to reuse it? And then if you need to change that rule, you only have to change the component once, not go through all of your rules and change them. So there's, there's um, big advantages to using that system. Can you tell us what uh, big changes we can expect in uh, Drupal 8? Uh, um, I, unfortunately, I can't. Uh, I haven't been doing any of the, the work on, uh, involved in any work on Drupal 8 uh, yet. So um, uh, I haven't, uh, can't unfortunately tell you anything about that. Um, as far as I, I know the actual, I think the, the main stuff in, in creating uh, the, the rules process and how it works will, will um, continue, but I suspect there will be in the new entity plugin configuration system. Um, so the way that they're imported and exported, I'm sure, will be um, much clearer and easy to follow. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Do you think rules should go into the core? Um, I, it, it, I think probably moving on next, it would, it would follow through um, if, if the views has, has made it in now. So rules is uh, follows through as it's, it's something, as I said, there's, if, if you start to look around modules, they're all, there's so many modules that have implemented their own sort of way of um, uh, implementing some events and conditions. So having one unified framework to be able to do that it seems to be the way. And that's, that's the same. Uh, views as, as a much longer history of doing that, but it, it was a unified way of creating the, the access to the data in the database tables. And um, so it, it, I should think it will follow the same sort of flow through. Another question? Yeah, um, I, f I find the U views, or sorry, rules UI um, a bit confusing, particularly for users that aren't familiar yeah. with it. Um, for instance, uh, the the commerce payment method system. Um, if it was a site builder, he would have to understand he has to enable the view, the rule, edit it, then edit the action to configure his settings. Is there a way that you could pull out those configurations, maybe in another custom module, um, with like variables or something, so they don't actually have to go through the UI? Yes. Does that make um, sense? So there are some uh, payment modules that are already looking at doing that, and uh, one of those that already has done is a U UK one called SagePay that um, has a separate configuration page. Um, now, there are some pros and cons to doing that because um, one of the main examples that we've got, uh, someone at the training yesterday was talking about um, their payment gateway. They actually have two configurations, one for um, for their recurring payments and one for their non-recurring payments, two different uh, account numbers. So they need to be able to have two rules and two different settings for their payment gateway. Um, whereas if you've got one configuration page, then you can't do that. So it's sort of deciding how you, you balance that. So there's a, either an option of providing a default set of configuration or what is configurable between the different implementations. 
Um, so uh, one of those examples that I've been working on with the American Express is when do you, uh, you might want to have 3D secure, that's um, when they get the second set of questions when you're making a payment. And you only, need to, you only want to enable the 3D secure checks if they've, they're paying over $2,000. And if, they're, if it's under that, you're not bothered about the 3D secure checks. And um, so it's, it's sort of questions on providing those, those options. And that's why it's gone that way. But um, as you say, some, some of the lower end uh, small merchants don't want that flexibility and just want to click and go. So there's a balance between the two. Uh, certainly the rules UI, as I said, about having to go entity has field and then all this sort of stuff can get confusing. And there's a, a lot of clicking in the UI for rules. So uh, on your additional modules page, you had uh, rules conditional, which I apologize. Um, I know is trying to be folded back into rules itself. And I was wondering if you could talk about how far along progress for that is and I guess for those who don't know what the module itself does. Um, so I'm not sure about the, the progress with um, bringing it into to the core of rules, but um, in, uh, in the action set area, in the action of a rule or a, um, a reaction rule, you can add an, uh, some effectively conditions within the actions. So that will say if this condition is met within the actions, then set the actions that you want to, to, to take place based on that. Condition, but they are quite simple conditions in terms of um, the uh, uh, data comparisons that, that really want to fit in there. And it is only one uh, condition that you can use in your if statement for in the action. So if you have some really complicated um, uh, conditions that you need to use, um, then it, it's using the, the multiple uh, components um, becomes often the best way again. Um, I can't remember if the, it, since I've last looked at the rules condition module, I'm not sure if um, the, you can use a condition component as the condition within the if statement. Uh, if not, then it's, that's probably what, uh, whether that's, I think there, there might be that in the issue cube. I don't know how far, far along that's got. Are there any more questions? Okay, thank you, David. Thank you So we'll be having a short coffee break, and we'll be back at 10.15. Thank you. So just before you rush off, I remind you, you can come and see the Commerce Village, where you can find out our, about our new platform for hosting solution that's there, and uh, all of our uh, partners that we're integrating with. And uh, finally, as well, just to ask you to go along and uh, do the evaluation on the uh, session schedule. <laughs>